here with Christine, <laughs> Christina <laughs> Pazitsky. Good. That was so good. I'm yeah. so proud of you. <laughs> she is uh, an actress, a stand-up mm. comedian, but more importantly, she's fucking crazy. Yes. And she's she's here. <laughs> And she had a crazy upbringing, and I didn't even know that you were uh, an actress or stand-up comedian when you when somebody recommended you to to me. They said, "Yeah, she grew up with a with a crazy mom. You should yeah. get her on as a guest." And so I just tweeted to you, and then found out kind of about who you were and stuff like that afterwards. Um, so you just your only qualification for the show is like, did you have a shitty childhood? Um. Or, or just have you been through something difficult? Oh, okay. Are you in something difficult? <laughs> okay. Um, that's, I, I that's thought you, okay. Yeah, no, it did. It, it, I get people who had pretty normal childhoods that hmm. have nothing that they can pinpoint their depression or their emptiness or whatever really? too. Yeah, um, I have a lot of listeners as uh, as guests because there's the pool of stories you can draw from from them um, is. Never, never ending, and they intimately know the show and the tone, and I love so, it. So yeah, and it's it's not about comedy or show business or anything. I mean, comedy is certainly welcomed, but yeah. Well, I, I, you know, initially when you reached out to me, I was like, absolutely, because I, I want people. There should be a dialogue about mental illness, and there isn't, and and people are so ashamed of the stuff they go through. Maybe because it's not a visible wound to like emotional problems and, and they're kind of downplayed or discredited. Like people and don't mista- believe you. And mistaken for weakness or bad attitude. Correct. Yeah. You should w- be able to will yourself out of this thing. Um, Americans or or aren't. you're just an asshole. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I feel so much empathy for people that live with borderline personality disorder because the average person just thinks, oh, what a dick, what a cunt. And they don't realize that the emotions that this person is experiencing are nuclear to them yes and the problem uh oh yeah here's the thing okay so my mother has borderline personality disorder and i didn't know that until four years ago when i started psychotherapy i just thought that my childhood was like everybody else's and everybody's mom loves them hates them kicks them out pulls them back in um you know i just thought everybody spent their childhood hiding in their bedroom listening to the fox and the hound record over and over to (laughs) avoid their mom like i didn't uh and honestly part of me I'm, i'm i'm a little afraid to share because i there's shame and there's I feel guilty for hating my mom. And how do I come on a fucking podcast and go, hey, I I don't really like my mom. Guess what? I don't like her. (laughs) Fuck her. I don't want want her in my life. I I cut my mom out of my life two years ago. And it's been the greatest vacation I've ever had. (laughs) It's not feeling the dread when I see her number. Yes, up, yes. Not feeling drained. It's, yes. It's like a vampire-like thing, and it's exactly what you described. Bring you in with praise and then stick the stick the knife in. Is, is your mom borderline as well? I, you know, she certainly has the traits uh, of yeah. it, but I, I, I don't know. I don't know. And ultimately, I think the label isn't as important yes. as our feelings uh, about, uh, about them, yes. but um, it's a great shorthand to, to have to be able to say, you know, my mom had borderline personality disorder, because then to the person, uh, yes, the other person you're sharing it with, they immediately go, oh, okay, I, I have an yeah. idea. Yeah, and even like, I, I, I was an only child up until my mother remarried to a sociopathic criminal when I was 12. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they met uh, from a singles ad in a newspaper in 1991. Uh, he sent her a photograph of himself in an uh, Armani suit and a cell phone next to his Mercedes. And a oh. month later, they were married, and I had an instant oh. family. And, uh, and a Mercedes. M- and a Mercedes, which was really worth it when you think about it. I mean, yeah, yeah. he's a sociopath. Yes, our lawn was set on fire, but I got a lot of nice stuff yeah. out of it. And you got to see him use that gigantic <laughs> brick cell phone from 1991. Yes, that's exactly the picture. The pretty woman cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> the box, the huge brick, yes. Yeah. Um, so I, that I, was neat. I believe you carried those around in a coffin. I think that was the carrying <laughs> case for it. <laughs> right. So I, I grew up with these three stepsisters later. And like, even now when I go, hey, you know, my mom, like the reason she divided us and split us into good and evil and this and that is because she's crazy. And a lot of them don't validate my experience of it. Like they're still in the cycle of this is normal for everybody, right? Like everybody throws plates of food. Everybody, 
experiences the awful shit we did. Like you got like that anyway. So it's invalidating on a lot of levels, I think. So invalidating. And and yeah. even if it's just the absence of them giving you the boilerplate stuff that you need as a kid, Oof. that'll fuck you up. But then on top Dude. of it, the abuse and the gaslighting. I think oh. that's the most difficult. Man, let's talk about, yeah, the gaslighting. It, the crazy making part, I mean, I'm assuming everyone knows what that is in your audience. Like, we don't have to. Yeah, the reference is from a, from a movie where um, uh, the, the manipulative person would keep changing the level of the, the gaslight, right. the lamp, and <laughs> saying that they hadn't. So the other person oh. began to think that they were crazy, that they were imagining it. Right. And that's, that's the experience of growing up with a mother that is a borderline is that you don't know what the fuck like i don't know if i'm right if i'm wrong i don't know if i'm loved if i'm not loved i don't know you just don't know anything and so you grow up with this weird lack of an inner core which i now i'm discovering who i am through the process of stand-up and aggressive psychotherapy in the last four years and if anyone you know you know what show i love watching is the sopranos Mm -hmm. and I was like, why am I so drawn to this? Well, the mother. The, the mom. Yeah. yeah. And the darkness. And my parents came from Hungary. They escaped from communism in uh, 1969. They escaped on foot. They were 20 years old. And they escaped to Italy, where they lived in a camp for a year. You know, they grew up poor. They grew up in, you know, there's World War One. There's World War Two. The Russians come and destroy Hungary. Like, just this poverty and oppression. They moved to Canada. My mother doesn't want children. My father's desperate for a child. Against her will, she has me. I ruined her body because she wanted to be a Vegas showgirl. I have dashed her dreams of that, oh right? Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, like, my parents both came from such trauma backgrounds, and I get that, and I get that intellectually. My dad's way more functional than my mother, thank God, so I had him as a beacon of what's not like what's normal. But my mom, dude. That probably saved you. I most definitely. And some American girlfriends that my dad had, like he dated this Albertson's checkout girl who was like the most normal American lady, like just to have touchstones of the culture that I lived in. Cause I felt like an alien. I'm an alien from another country and I'm an alien because what's going on at home. I know isn't right, but I'm an only child at the time and I can't go to school. And I, I knew I couldn't tell the teachers cause I knew that if I did something bad would happen. Like I just knew Anyway, as we know, borderlines, they don't, the fear, the central fear is that I will be rejected, right? Which is why they, they're like porcupines. Like you want to put your arms around them and hug them, but ow, it hurts because they're deflecting you, whatever. My mother divorces my dad at age four, once we move here to the valley. And now my life gets fucked up. Like she threatens to keep me away from him. And then my life with her alone begins because she gets custody because it's 1980 and moms get custody of their children. And I've never really talked about the details of growing up with her because it's still I'm still not over. Like I cried this morning preparing. I, I had to go and write notes about wow. what what it happened because I had blocked it out. And I was in the shower this morning like I never had a mother. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's still I'm still I cry from time to time. Over not having... It hurts. Yeah. It fucking hurts. Yeah. You know, when the person who is supposed to be your protector is your abuser, it's <sighs> it doesn't get deeper than that. And how is the world not <laughs> terrifying when that's your template? <laughs> it's like, imagine people that don't, aren't supposed to like me, how are they going to treat me? Ooh. Oh, it's and- so hard to be vulnerable and intimate and trust them because you're like, what's their angle? How, how are they going to stick the shiv in? Well, and then on top of that, to be a stand-up comedian... And to translate that into your gig where it's all about approval, disapproval. Do they love me? Do they hate me? And then have managers and agents who might resemble people who are oh, mother. Yeah. Oh, it's sticky. <laughs> Remember one time uh, I was upset that my manager didn't call me on my birthday. <laughs> and my wife went, he's not your dad. Fucking let it right. go. Quit confusing your issues that's a business that you know right and i was pissed at her but after like a couple hours i knew she was right and it is that and then you go through life going oh these are just triggers that this person and i even feel weird calling this person my mom like when i say mom i i don't want to use a real name in Mm -hmm. this interview i don't i never had it i never had it could you call her the vag you walked out of (laughs) Yeah, I'll say that. Uh, she had a cesarean. My father claimed she wouldn't open up enough. So you popped out like a birthday cake. I did. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, where do we begin? Like, mm. 
God well, let's, damn. let's start with uh, your your earliest memories. Oh, okay. Well, we moved to my earliest memory. This is this is horrific too. My first memory is of uh, of my father sitting me down on our counter and here in the valley when we first moved here and telling me that he's leaving. That's literally my first memory from childhood. The first cogent memory that I have. And like, yeah, it's. What do you remember thinking or feeling or? I was so confused. You don't understand. I didn't understand as a child. Like, do you think? Did you think it was your fault? No. Uh, interesting. I didn't. Wow, that's rare. Yeah, I didn't blame myself. I kind of intuitively knew she was the cause. Ah. I knew it because I, I had a love repulsion thing with mom. I'm sure, I imagine you might have too. Where you're like, <laughs> I'm so confused. Do I? I love you, hate you all the time. I. Well, the the thing that was difficult was. Her her actions didn't match her words. Oh. She would praise me and praise me and sometimes cut me down, but the actions were always very confusing. Yes. You know, but go ahead. Always confusing. Yeah, I was never valid. I was always validated for being pretty or not pretty enough. She wanted me to be an actor, so I was in acting class from the time I was like four, five. She wanted me to be the Vegas showgirl that she wanted to become. Oh, wow. But isn't it neat how I took up the torch of becoming yeah. a show? Oh, they win. <laughs> well, plus the thing that's that's so <sighs> difficult is the love is conditional. Yeah. It's like if you, if you can um, come over to their side and their point of view, it's oh. love, love, love. But if you disagree... Right. Uh, you know, if you disagreed with my mom, she would not let it go. Even when it would come to a memory that yes. th that I had in my twenties, something that actually happened to me that she wasn't even there for, she she kept saying no, it didn't happen. And it was it was innocuous. It was having fillings replaced in my mouth, <laughs> and she was like, "You didn't have your fillings replaced," and I was like. No, I was there. I, rem I remember it. And she's like, no, you didn't. She wouldn't let it go. And there was like a hostility to it that. Um, He's sorry. Or, He's with my dog. He's rolling no, around. It's He's all just good. mashing his face in your carpet. What's, it, what's his name? Theo Huxtable. Oh, I had to bring so, him in. I'm sorry. It's that's, so, that's not a problem. Actually, um, I recorded an episode a little while ago. Um, and when I was doing the, the outro to it, um, my little dog, Herbert, <laughs> was taking exception apparently to what i was saying <laughs> and was letting it be not known interested not yeah um but anyway so yes. yeah that's the, the thing that is so difficult is the conditional love because then yes. it's like my happiness depends on you accepting me so it makes perfect sense to me that you become a, a <sighs> stand-up comedian yeah and it's very fucked now that i understand that dynamic and how do i continue doing stand-up in in the light of knowing my history because it triggers every trigger and I how have. do you shake off a bad show because oh, it means well, that you're worthless right well and that thing that you're talking about the invalidation the like my mother took it to the extreme of i remember when i mean this happened i got kicked out about every once a month my mother starting at what age oh uh, from the time my folks divorced so like four or five what yeah you kicked out to where <laughs> yeah exactly so I, my mother had custody of me and so um things like you have too many socks um, what do you mean? You're stealing your father's socks. You have too many socks. Let's count these socks. And she would count the pairs of socks that I, yeah, I had taken from my dad because I'm a kid. I don't care. I liked his socks. And that was grounds to kick me out of her home. We just lived in a small two bedroom apartment in Tarzana. And I never forget the very first time she kicked me out. I was in second grade and she was yelling at me all morning about the socks and the socks and then uh, drops me off. It was a Thursday morning because we had church that morning. I went to a religious school and I remember thinking, oh, I'm late for church. Church was the one place that felt okay. I loved Jesus as a small child. I loved the idea of a God watching over me because I knew that it wasn't cool at home. And, and somebody who yeah. you're told loves you unconditionally. Right. Oh, isn't that interesting? Yeah. So I remember her pulling into the parking lot and just, you know, in this little Toyota Tercel and saying, that's it. You're going to, you're kicked out. I'm kicking you out of the house. You're going to live with your father. Go live with your father. And I was just bereft as a second grader of just bawling, bawling, bawling. And I went to the church where everyone was already. And I knew instinctually to cover that up. I knew that if I told the teacher that something like I I just knew and thus began the process of like having feelings 
sucking it up and going to perform like that's the beginning of my career as a performer but then anyways i go live with my dad because so she kicked me out for whatever stupid reason and then his house was better oh my god i almost knocked my teeth out again um, his she, house, she has veneers that I've she veneered. said are threatening to pop off. They popped out yeah. this morning. Yeah, sorry. I hope, yeah. I hope while you were uh, crying in the shower was when they <laughs> popped out. <laughs> ah, that would be the best. Oh, Tom, I don't have any front teeth. <laughs> clunk, clunk. I have like two nubbins right now for, yeah. for real front teeth. Um, so I go to my pop's house and my dad was doing the best he could, you know, an immigrant. But that house wasn't exactly stable really in all terms either so i'd call my mom to apologize because which is what you have to do because i i clearly have done something wrong mm. right i'm sorry you can't call them on their behavior because that would that's like they don't do anything wrong that's a brick wall that's, that's you're wall. the one yeah so i'd call her and she wouldn't pick up my phone calls so it was two weeks of leaving messages on your mother's answering machine and you're in, in second, second grade, grade. That that breaks my heart. Yeah. That breaks my heart. I mean, <sighs> the stuff that I shared with you about my mom, I want to retract it all because oh, no. it just feels like uh, it's not even in the same fucking league with what with what you're 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 dealing with. You think yeah. so? Because oh, yeah. I listened to something you said and I was like, I wanted to cry. Or I listened to Ryan Sickler's episode that he did, and I I literally was in the dentist chair with tears streaming down my face because something. I guess when you're in it, it's not that the weird part is, is that it's it's bad, but it's not that bad. You can tolerate so much as a, as a kid. You can tolerate so much as a human. And maybe because when you hear the other person describe it, you're hearing the greatest hits of the abuse. Yes. yes. And you're not hearing the moments of um, the good moments, because I don't know about you, but there <laughs> there were good moments with my mom. There really? were some moments where I felt um like this person loves me and that's one of the things that makes it so difficult to trust my my own instincts or my own um i forget yeah. the what what the word is but um it sounds like there was just nothing good with with you and your mom from well, from that reaction you just had yeah and i try like i i actively try i'm in psychotherapy i go i've been going once a week for 4 years and it's completely changed my life like it's been the greatest thing and and I try now actively to go back because I was angry for a long time. I fucking hated her. And now I'm turn, turning the corner where I'm like, all right, I forgive. And it's not I understand that it really wasn't her fault. She's not she's not there. It's like expecting my dog Theo to give me something that he's just not. He can't cook for me. <laughs> um but yeah, dude, I mean... He can lay a steaming turd, <laughs> which in desperate situations can be thought of as a meal. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what was I... Oh, I forget what I was saying. Yeah, yeah. that... that uh, but I forgive her and I... Oh, sorry, the few good moments. There are a few good memories I have. I One time we made brownies together and that was fun. And then one time... <laughs> <laughs> I actively... Do you want... I wrote them down. Yeah. Here we go. Because that's one of the things that I that, that I I want to know about relationships between a person and an abuser, because that's the thing that I think it makes it so easy to minimize it is to just go. But what about those good things? What oh, about those boy. good things? And it's so hard to hold those two experiences at the same time yeah. and say this was a complicated person. But yeah. Yeah, go ahead. So well, what, I'm trying some, to, and I'm actively trying to. We got the to, brownies. Because, I, yeah, the brownies were neat that one time. We made instant brownies. And then uh, the only time my mother was calm and happy and in a good place was when uh, Love Connection came on. Oh. 7 p.m. and there's two episodes. So I was like, oh, good. The magic hour in our apartment was 7 to 8 p.m. when Chuck Woolery would do Love Connection. And my mother and I would lay sight like we would spoon on the couch. And she was so into Chuck Woolery and, and love. And the irony is that my mother loved love. She wanted that. She We'd watch The Love Boat and we would watch Love Connection. And those were the hours that I felt complete and safe and whole is when she and I would watch television together. 
And I know that she desperately wanted self-help. Like we had every self-help book. The irony is every self-help book on her shelves. Like she had Barbara DeAngelis, How to Make Love All the Time. And <laughs> I'm okay, you're okay. And Dr. Wayne Dyer. I grew up, I read all this. She made me read all this So stuff, it sounds like she had a degree, a shred of self-awareness <laughs> where she like knew it wasn't okay to kick a second grader out. But, I think so. Well, you know, people that live with borderline personality disorder, um, it's their emotional outbursts are like it's like trying to control a raging fire from, from what I I, I yeah. understand. And so it, she must have lived with so much guilt and shame or certainly yes. moments of it. Yes. And here's the thing, too, is that, yes, and I, I imagine that, too. And I, the one thing that saved me is that she worked for a psychiatrist. Another irony amongst, right? And this man was wonderful, and he helped me a lot, and I could go to him. I think he knew that my something was up. Oh, how could he not? Yeah. Um, but the shame part, and my mother didn't want to admit that maybe she wasn't a perfect mom. That was a huge part of it. Like I, So what happened with me is like, so this whole childhood of push, pull, you're out, you're in, you suck, you're amazing, comes to a head. Like I turned 12 years old and I have this nervous breakdown because I'm, I'm all alone with her too. Keep in mind, this is, I'm an only fucking child, dude. It's me and her. So wow. I have no mirror. I have no one to go. Yeah, she is like, this is nutty. I just go into my room and I play records, like I said, and hide. I was just, I spent most of my childhood hiding in a bedroom. What hey, did you, yeah. uh, that's okay. What did you think when you watched Mommy Dearest <laughs> and the kid's name is Christina? Yeah, I know. And the irony is I just watched that movie like a month ago with my husband. And I was like, dude, wait a minute. Did this you, isn't this far off. What did it bring up in you when you were watching it? I got it. I was like, that's a lot of my, that's, if my mother were an actress, which is what she wanted to be, that was her. And I... That Christina thing of smile, everything's great. We're doing this right. You look amazing. Everything's perfect. And I, by the time I hit 12, the shit hit the fan because I had become suicidal, depressed. I was cutting. I was, I hated school because I was getting into fights with people. I, it was a nightmare for me because I thought I was crazy. That's the problem with the gaslighting stuff is that you start to think it's your, you are, clearly I'm a bad person because you don't trust your own integrity yeah that was the word i was looking for that my therapist told me was she integrity. said you, you don't trust your own integrity and i struggle i'm getting much better at that now where i go oh i'm allowed to feel mad at my agent right now i'm allowed to feel like i need a boundary here okay but yeah dude so i get i get crazy i turn 12 and i freak out and i try to kill myself in a in in the school bathroom stall <laughs> i was cutting myself and i was like i'm just gonna fucking finish this off go all the way yeah and i i had been in a spiral for like a year actually i was 14 by the time i tried to do that and i um i'm just i was this is it i gotta go because i i don't know what's wrong something's wrong and it's me it's got to be me and i i remember i the school called her because they found me in this bathroom stall just covered in blood and i had you know, it was very dramatic. Fourteen-year-old girl acting out. Uh, you know that that is dramatic. <laughs> you know yeah. that's not a that's not a fourteen-year-old girl being overly dramatic. <laughs> you know, because her boyfriend broke up with her. No, that's, and I don't I don't believe any fourteen-year-old girl that cuts is being overly dramatic. They they are. Oh, it's in it. Yeah, you're in it. You're you're in it. And people that say that they do that for attention, I want to punch them. I agree. I think to hurt to harm yourself, and and I look at fourteen-year-old girls now and they're babies i was a baby and i was smoking cigarettes dropping acid i was in hollywood every weekend i was doing bad shit why why was i running the streets at 14 and it's because my mother was remarried to this new guy new family oh fuck her you know my daughter's out she's she's not behaving how i want her to behave anyway get the fuck out of here so and the, the worst part of it is like i I remember just being in such the depths of despair. I was like, I, I, I want to die. And I, they found me at school. They called my mother. She comes to the school. This is my favorite part of this. And uh, she sees my arms. She sees the state that I'm in and proceeds to beat the shit out of me and oh, hit me. Yeah. my <laughs> God. It really was all about her. Yeah. Yeah. It really was. Yes. 
that's the pain of it is I go, well, motherfucker, like, what do I have to do here? And I had said to her before, I I had said to her countless times, I need help. You got to send me to a mental hospital because I had friends that were in mental hospitals and it sounded pretty great. You get to make bracelets and go to group therapy (laughs) and like something. And you get to collapse. Right, right, right. You get to collapse. Wow. Where nobody's going to judge you. Right. You're expected to collapse in a mental hospital. I fantasize sometimes about going into a mental hospital and just being in bed. Like Me go, too, going in, still. <laughs> going into regular hospitals, I've always, not only do I not dread it, I kind of in, I kind of enjoy it. I, I yeah. My favorite moment is right before they put you under because, you know, a sweet nurse, you know, nurses just have that, that comforting motherly vibe about yeah. them. And they put a warm blanket on you and then they shoot you up with Valium. Oh, man. It's like, I've, that's what I wanted my whole life was to feel warm and fuzzy and cared for. So I totally get the, the wanting to go to a mental hospital. But, you, you know, we have a survey on the, on the website where people share their experiences in mental hospitals yes. and many, 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 many of them are anything but warm and fuzzy. Yeah, my best friend, Jenny, uh, who just came on my this podcast I'm starting to, talks about she grew up in a mental home essentially from age uh, 15, no, 13 to 18. Her, she was in a series of them, and uh, it's no, it, I get that it's no salvation. She was in mental, mental home or mental hospital? She was in mental hospitals, yeah. I guess. Her mother had put her in very, she and I were best friends at the time. And the decision for her was to go into mental hospitals and the decision for me, what my mother decided rather than shame herself and admit to being a shit mother, maybe, right, or being incapable, she decided the best thing for me was to go to Catholic school. (laughs) (laughs) Right? Your life is delicious. (laughs) It is like a, it's like a the darkest chocolate truffle you think so is, for, oh, i'm, I'm for, so pleased for for this show yeah for this show yeah it is like a handmade swiss chocolate <laughs> wrapped in a ribbon <laughs> given to me the host can i can i tell you that coming from someone who only yeah. listens to horrible stories that's yeah. really wonderful thank you you really really you think it's god damn it oh i'm Christina, so used to it it's, oh good it's <laughs> My heart breaks, and yet it, it, I, uh, because your attitude, because you're you're now realizing that it wasn't you, it just makes me want to stand. It makes me want to oh. slow clap you. Right, right. It makes oh, me want to oh, slow no. clap you in a good way. In yeah, a good yeah. way, like like. I just want to hug you. I oh, just want to so hug sweet. you. Thanks. You know, it's I'll take hugs. Yeah, and, I, and I I think the listeners right now are feel the exact same way like mm. your spirit is just fucking oh God, beautiful so embar- and i get embarrassed by positive uh, feedback just so you know i'm like i get really thanks thank uh-huh. you for saying that and i here's the thing about me that i knew at a very early age when i was four that was the last time i remember being a child like i think four years old was the last time i was a kid and then i grew up into an adult by the time i was like six i i think i had lost whatever light but the person I really am is the person I was for, you know what I mean? Not the suffering and not the, um, not the bullshit. And I don't know. It's just, if anybody is listening to this and they are tortured by the shit they went through, know that that's not you. That's your, that's the physical body. That's your ego. That's what happened to something at a stage in your life. It's not truly who you are. I think I just got out of survival mode like this year. Where I, I wasn't always panicked. I wouldn't wake up. I I don't wake up anymore with that. Like, oh, what am I gonna do? To I gotta make money. I gotta <laughs> like that that functioning anxiety, right? That running I just, game. I was just saying yesterday to someone, I when the sun rises, I have a personal grudge against it. Like, <laughs> really, we have to do this again? <laughs> All right. Oh, I remember that How one. How dare you? Yeah. And also because we live longer, I was just saying this to someone like, I'm 37 now and I should be dead, right? In the medieval period, like I'd just be long dead. And you think, fuck, I got to do this for like another, hopefully another 37. And some days are just like, why do I do this again? Why am I telling shit jokes to people in Ohio who sometimes don't give a fuck? Or why am I, why do I do the things I do? And I don't know. I don't know the answer. Some days are great and some days aren't great, right? But here we go. On the upside of everything, those nuns, 
because I had such a strong foundation in Jesus and, and I loved all that stuff, the nuns ironically saved my, they, I say ironically, it's not ironic at all. They There's saved my awesome life. There's some awesome fucking nuns out yeah. there. Yeah, there are. And I know a lot of people had different experiences, but the school I went to was all girls and it, we wore uniforms and I'm blessed enough that my parents had the money to send me somewhere like that. Like that was the blessing is that like I could put my bag down and it wouldn't get stolen. And that was huge for me. And I did feel safe and I made great friends and I, I had problems. I mean, I had a mohawk, I had an orange mohawk <laughs> when I was put in that school and I was seen as a troubled, which I was, I, I had yeah. straight D's when I applied to the school. I had straight D's and one fail. And I begged my mother and I went into this nun, her this principal nun, and cried and begged them to let me into this school because I was I was I was on the edge of either failure or something what, else. What in your and you were fourteen at that time? Yeah, ninth grade. What in your mind was the school going to to give you? Just that you wanted sanctuary. in because I I grew up I went to public school I went to private school and then my mother in sixth grade decided to pull me out of this nice Christian school because I needed to learn about real life my life was too easy according to my mother and she wanted to quote toughen me up uh. so <laughs> so she sends me to the school called Portola which is actually here in in the valley and at the time they were busing in kids from like rougher neighborhoods and on the outside I look like a lot of girls like I'm a blonde and I imagine I look like a pretty spoiled kid but it, it wasn't I wasn't that person and I don't know I was also very angry and I did pick a lot of fights with people <laughs> it was I hated school so I was like I'm just gonna stop going I just fucking I hate it so I just wanted a place where I didn't worry about getting my ass kicked every day and like not having to be goth because I was goth too and like I it was nice to not have to be super gothic because like you know when you're a kid you identify with that culture like oh was my shirt cool enough today am I cool enough today and so plus I, yeah I would imagine too there there was something uh, alluring about the structure of oh it. coming God, from, yes. from such chaos it's like okay there's 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 an order to, yeah. to what they have in store for me. Yeah, and I wanted to go to boarding school. I begged for that one. They found one in Germany. It was too expensive. I was like, yeah, send me to fucking Germany. <laughs> get, me, get as far away from this. You know, I couldn't wait to get out. I just had to get the fuck out. Did you Did you move out early? Because I had turned uh, 17. I was like, I'm... No, I'm no. I, I didn't even realize that um, anything was wrong until... I went into therapy at 25 mm. and my therapist pointed out that it was inappropriate for my mom to be grabbing my ass and tell me how cute I was. Oh, God. Now, to me, that's, to me, hearing that is the ultimate, because that's, that's mommy. That's so sexually caught. Like, how do you, how do you? When it's been done to you your whole life, you don't, you first of all you kind of shut down because you go i don't enjoy this but i'm so used to things being on my mom's terms mm -hmm. and and she's so fragile and unhappy this makes her happy so mm -hmm. i'm going to let her i i didn't even know what my needs were so that was the first awakening that i didn't have a sense of of what my needs were other than bringing myself pleasure you know getting loaded right. you know sleeping needs, around like emotional needs and yeah. so i i didn't have those either until in my 30s yeah. yeah um but that that was the first time that i i realized something might not it might not be as rosy as i thought i was because if you had asked me at 24 what you know actually i think i th think i went to therapy at like 23 anyway it doesn't matter um if you'd asked me before then what was you know your your family life like i'd say it was awesome i'm right. super super privileged you know my parents and on paper, it was. They paid for my college. Mm. You know, they helped me uh, financially when I when I needed it. So, but as as you know, there's a difference between what our functional day to day lives are given and what our soul is yeah. is given. And I think if you come from abuse, you learn to shut down your soul and to not listen to it and not trust your integrity or yeah. your experience. And so then you just think well, I'm sad and angry because that's who I am. And yes. you're not that four-year-old girl who 
was sweet and yeah and, and, hopeful, and hopeful and joyful i my core is actually quite joyful and i know that that's not hip to say as a comedian but i really do like i have so much empathy for people who suffer and i get it because like maybe that's a function of having gone through so much shit is that you like i don't try not to judge people even like the sour face person at a show like never judge them just because they're not laughing at you you, you don't, don't know, know what, what they're going through the fuck happened to them before they stepped into your showroom you don't you don't yeah and i think that's why i'm so touched by you and your story is it, it, it's your spirit you do have a hopefulness and a sense of humor about it that um to me i never get tired of 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 hearing it it just reminds me that our abuse and our story is not the entirety of our lives. It's a That's por- right. it's a portion of it. Yes, and also like, I mean, you seem to be pretty functional and happy too, and have fi- have grown past it. Obviously, because you can talk about this mm-hmm. stuff. But yeah, and and also understanding that my past will not define me. Don't you dare rob me of my happiness going forward. And that's like. And that's why I wanted to do this show because I, I just complaining about my mom and the poor me. I was worried like I don't want to come off as that person. That's you like, don't. I'm a victim. Like, and I actively choose not to. I choose not to identify that way because it's fucking lame. You know, like there's a point where you go, all right, this did happen. Now it's my responsibility as an adult to go forward. And I want to have kids. And, and and that's such a great point. Is once we do realize what had happened to us. It's then our responsibility, which seems like it sucks, but it's the truth. <laughs> we have a responsibility to our loved ones and to ourselves to say, okay, what am I going to do to process this? And, you know, I yeah. always say that hopefully we don't reexamine our childhoods to make our parents suffer. We do it so we can process the feelings we've been running from so we can stop suffering. Absolutely. I agree with that. And also... Um, it's funny because my, my dad, like I love him and we're very close and I'm very lucky. All you, all you need is one good parent. I think Ryan Sickler said that too. He's like, you just need one. And I agree. If you have, you're lucky to have two great. If you get one person in your family that you could tolerate, like, oh my God. And so my father, you know, we had our shit growing up too, but like the fact that he's lucid enough to say, you know what? I'm sorry. I may have fucked up when you were a kid here and there. I may have not done the right thing. I forgive. And I'm like, you're right. You know what? I still love you. But the fact that my mother will never have the ability to say, hey, I'm sorry. I think I may have messed up here. That's what that's the fucker of this is that I can't get that closure of, hey, you know, you're crazy, right? You know, there's a reason I don't talk to you. And it's not because I'm an asshole and everyone else is a jerk in the family. She thinks we're everyone in the family ignores yeah. her because we're all jerks. And I've tried to tell her, like, do you really, you don't see the commonality, the thread here? Uh, okay. All right. Uh, and I'll never get that. That's what kills me. I don't, it doesn't, I can't, I will never get the validation of, of that. And she's going to die physically one day, which is okay. I'm okay with that because uh, she's dead in my heart. She's dead to me already. So the physical death, and I hate this, this is even awful. I know what you're going to say. It's a and relief. I agree, a relief. <laughs> I I had a moment when the last time I stayed with my mom was like three years ago and she was gaslighting me and, and, you know, just pushing and pulling and, and she wanted to wake up one morning and, and she wanted to read like spiritual passages from, from a book. And this was like 10 minutes after her invalidating and, and, and poking at me and, and I said to her, Mom, I know you want to be closer to me, but I don't feel safe around you. Mm. And it got no reaction. It was almost like she was looking through me. And then the next morning, I woke up before she did, and I walked past her bedroom door, and she was asleep. And my first thought was, I hope she never wakes up. <laughs> and then I felt like a terrible person. <laughs> right. and, but then I'd been in enough recovery to go, that's not on me. Those are my feelings, and my feelings are fucking valid. Yeah. They may not be based in reality. I think they were in that situation. But I, <laughs> I need to give credence to them, at least to examine them and go, am I filtering my fear through something, or is this reality? 
reality. Yeah. And that was reality. I, don't, don't you wish we could talk like this every day, all day? It'd be so much better. You know what? I got to say, being in my support groups, I do. Oh, maybe I should join support. Yeah. Because I listen to Hay House Radio a lot. I don't know if you know what that is. No. Like Louise Hay and Marianne Williamson, like all this oh, okay. self-help. Kind of touchy-feely stuff. God, I love it. Yeah, it's yeah. really helped me. But it would be nice to do this, uh, not just an hour in therapy. I should probably do that. Yeah, it'd be good. I'm sure there's a borderline it's, group somewhere, right? There there are um, support groups out there for children who were raised by dysfunctional uh, parents. Uh, oh, yeah. My I, mom dragged me to... I remember my mother dragged me to, like, Codependent Anonymous meetings when I was a teenager. Like, well, doesn't it ruin it for you when the, <laughs> that person drags you to that, yeah. to that meeting? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. my mom pushed me for the longest time to... <laughs> to, to go into the support group that she was in, which is for the loved ones of the alcoholic. Ugh. And to this day, um, I went to a few of them and I just, I, maybe I'll go back, but I couldn't do it because it reminded me of her. Yeah. And there were women in there that reminded me of my mom, Oof. but but recovered, but yeah. still, there's still the traits of it that, that reminded me of it. And like, I think... Th- like the physicality of these women, or just the, the, the way they would they, talk, and yeah. you know, kind of, kind of overly chatty, and yeah, and, all that high energy, yeah, yeah. that kind of high energy, that kind of controlling um, <sighs> thing that that just, uh, I, I like recoil like it's a hot fucking flame when I'm around uh, that that kind that of energy, energy sometimes, too. where where there's where you get the feeling that there's a fucking rage underneath yeah. it it's like that 50s housewife face on top of the rage yeah. and you're like okay when's the mask gonna pop off and yeah. i'm gonna see the scales yeah when's the other the other foot gonna the other shoe gonna drop other shoe gonna drop, and yeah. i you know what's interesting you say that about like i i had the hardest time too being a woman and like um identifying with traditionally feminine things because i i i rejected so much so much of what my mother was that it almost threw me into existing how do they they can they call it in latin via negativa like a negative relation to like i had defined myself so my mother's materialistic she married for money i'm marrying for love i'm gonna study philosophy i'm you know i'm gonna get into buddhism i'm gonna do the exact opposite and then you realize like oh she still has control over me mm-hmm. this isn't about this is still about her god damn it this is still about <laughs> her this fucking bitch man and then you go okay well who really am i i thought i hated purple I thought I hated purple. No, my mother hated purple. I thought I hated wearing dresses. No, my mother hated putting me in dresses. I thought I didn't want long hair. No, my mother didn't want me to have long hair. Wow. And I think that process in, in not in philosophy, in therapy is you go, oh, who the fuck am I? Like, I, I love, uh, I love unicorns. That was my mother who said I shouldn't like that stuff. And are these all ex- uh, yeah real examples? <laughs> yeah, okay. pink. The color pink. I, she wouldn't let me wear pink. She wouldn't let me order chicken pot pies at Coco's, and like <laughs> because she didn't like chicken pot pies. Oh my god! And they're like, well, I, I quite like them. They're really delicious. I like a, I like that stuff. And I thought that was all my stuff. And that's what you realize. It's not your stuff. It was. It's her stuff. I think the saddest thing I've heard so far is that there's somebody that doesn't like pot pies. <laughs> that is... Oh, she hates anything. How do you anything? not like a good pot pie? She hates American stuff like that, yeah. It's like soup and pie. I know. It's two it's awesome things. Crusty, flaky. Oh, a Come good crust. Up. There's nothing like a good crust. I know, right? Yeah, and people that prefer cake over pie, I don't trust. Uh, I agree, yeah. Well, what kind of cake? I don't like white frosting or white... Like those cheap just Gelson cake or Ron's nothing cakes. should be compared to pie. Pie is just a good fruit pie. There's nothing. <laughs> there's nothing like it. It's what's it's your? I don't best. like key lime though. I, I'll no, throw that no, in the street. Yeah. Um, berry berry pies. Yeah. Uh, oh, for strawberry sure. rhubarb. A good strawberry oh, that's rhubarb. Good. Is, what is uh, rhubarb anyway? It's just it brings that tart to it. Just makes oh, it so complex. It's so, so good. It's so good. How yeah. do we get off on that? Oh, it's oh, pot pies. Pie, yeah. So, so defining and also kind of like and I and I see myself in the last few years like on stage I just I deliberate I do this because I think it's hard for women and stand up as it is and I I don't like to be sexualized when I'm trying to get people to listen to me but I even look at how I dress kind of you know I'm kind of butchy and I I don't mind that but now I'm going yeah I really kind of like flowy dresses I I think that's who I am and and it's okay and and then I start to incorporate stuff about her 
in me like she wears red lipstick and she has red nails because she's this blonde hair blue eyed beautiful woman she's so pretty on the outside my god it's so deceptive <laughs> <laughs> that's the problem too is that she's goddamn charming yep Ooh, and isn't that a pisser when everyone wants oh your mom God, to be their mom? Your mom is so adorable. <laughs> she is so sweet. And there's a side to her that is. But, yeah. But it's like, oh, you should hear her just going on rants about the neighbors. Right. Going on rants about my dad. Going on rants oh. about every relative. Oh. I don't think there's a relative, uh, with the exception <laughs> of maybe uh, some cousins, that, that I haven't heard her pick apart. For sure. Or um, My mother uh, would take issue with the waitress. I remember her at the Japanese restaurant. She sat, she sat us down next to the toilet because she fucking hates me because she's, she's a Japanese or whatever. I'm like, oh, it's because she's Asian. She sat us down <laughs> in a, an undesirable. How does that make any sense to you? Fucking bitch. I'll fucking tell her. And then she would like confront the Asian waitress with a racial slur and like... Oh. And the worst part is when she got remarried to a sociopath. So she remarries this Indian guy who's a fucking psycho, too. Now the two of them are like high fiving each other at the dinner table about who they've screwed over that day, oh. like bragging. And then my stepdad would start fights in public, like at the supermarket, like, oh, you're fucking kid. Your kid's too loud. What? Fuck you, bitch. And like would start fights oh, with strangers. And I was like, this is insane. Like, I. I had to get like I had to get out. I got out as soon as I could once I was old enough. Uh, yeah. But what did that feel like? Fantastic. I uh, went to college. Barely got into college, but I did, and it was. But then I had running anxiety about failing because I was like, if I fail at college, I I gotta go this back home. This is my last chance. Yeah. <laughs> I had hives the first year. Oh, my God. Because you're like, I got to get straight A's because I got to make something of myself because I got to get out. I got to get out. I got to be somebody. And that's the, also the sickness, too, is like, I thought that if I just became somebody, if I became successful, then that would cover up the hole, right? That would fix this gaping wound. And I'm, I feel successful in my career. And, and guess what? It didn't uh, didn't do that. I can't. It can't, yeah. you know, n no amount of financial success will ever heal a, a childhood wound. No, no other person will ever heal that. They may aid us in our recovery, but, you know, ultimately we got to learn to love ourselves. And that is the fucking Mount Everest. <sighs> how do you do that? That is the Mount Everest. Well, I want to hear how you uh, <laughs> are, are starting to do it. How, what, what it was like the first time maybe you got a glimmer of that. Cause it, mm. it sounds like you, you're, you know the fact that you're starting to recognize what you what you like was that the first yeah. part for you to to go i like that and i'm yeah. not going to judge it yeah i like that and also why am i living my life so hard why am i in what way um why am i on the road every week what's that about why am i why were you why are the stakes so high for me because i thought that i had to be six i have to be number one i have to be the best i have to I have, if i don't do this i will fail failure if i fail i'm a bad person mom's right you know um that black and white thinking yeah which i also share uh <laughs> there's a great article called co-narcissism by dr alan rapaport and one of the things he says that children um who grew up with a narcissistic parent struggle with is nuanced thinking everything yeah. has is black or white i'm a piece of shit or i'm the king and boy just being a stand-up comedian oh. feed into that because you have a great show and you're like i'm fucking set yeah i'm on the right path you have a terrible show and you're like i'm a fraud yeah well let's uh, let's take a little pause here and give uh, some love to uh, a sponsor of ours uh pill pack god bless him for supporting this show and uh PillPack is a uh, an online pharmacy that delivers pills, vitamins, whatever you want, pre-sorted meds uh, right to your door. They they bundle them according to uh, what days you need them, what time of the day, and they just roll out like uh, almost like those things that dispense uh, deli tickets to you at the at the deli counter. It's uh, it's such a great idea because I don't know about you, but I'm constantly second guessing myself, going, did I forget to take my meds today? It's nice you don't have to wait in line at the pharmacy judging other people for uh, not having their meds filled on time or going to the pharmacy and getting your prescription partially filled and having to come back and wait in that long line again. Uh, pill pack ships to uh, prescriptions to 33 states and non-prescriptions to all 50. And here's the part that I think is awesome. It's super easy to unroll. All you got to do is contact you and they contact your old pharmacy and make sure that 
everything gets forwarded. They time it out right. It's, uh, they've, they've really thought of everything and they have great customer service because they know that your meds are important. So um, go to their website. It's pillpack.com slash happy hour. And that way they'll know that you're listeners of ours. And uh, maybe there's a chance if you go there and visit. If enough of you do that, they'll keep supporting our show and uh, help keep uh, this baby afloat financially. And um, yeah, again, go to pillpack.com slash happy hour. And uh, you'll get the first month free too when you visit it. Once again, pillpack.com slash happy hour. And uh, so now let's get back. We were talking about uh, having bad shows and uh, feeling like being a fraud. And I recently, that's absolutely 100% accurate. And I've gotten over that because I go, oh, well, there's another show tomorrow. And we all fail. And it wasn't their cup of tea. Or maybe they enjoyed it, but they just smiled and they didn't laugh. Yeah. And I also like, you know, you you just realize, too, this is not for me. This is someone else's thing. Who cares? I'm over that hump. You know what I started doing, and this is so fucking embarrassing, and I can't even believe I'm going to tell you this. This is, abs- abs- ugh, I'm just going to do it because if it helps somebody out there, then please do this too. So Louise Hay, uh, founder of Hay House Radio, she's this wonderful, like 80 year old, weirdly enough, blonde hair, blue eyed woman, kind of a maternal figure, isn't that weird, Christina? <laughs> that you would want to identify <laughs> with. She, um, she started like. The self-help movement, she believed that you could heal your body by healing your mind, and she helped people with AIDS in the 80s. And uh, she wrote, she has this book, like, How to Love Yourself, and she has this exercise. Oh, I can't believe I'm fucking sharing this. Okay. Do this. Go in the mirror. Go look in the mirror and say, I love you to yourself. Just try it. And she says, see what comes up. And I try, like, the first time you do it, well, wow. I, I couldn't believe how much I hated myself. What do I, I don't listen for years. I wouldn't listen to recordings of my voice. Cause Oh my God, I hate this. I hate it. Oh, I can't uh, that, that criticism. So my mother didn't have to criticize me anymore. Cause I had internalized that lovely voice telling me what a piece of shit I was. Yeah, The Trojan horse was in. <laughs> <laughs> it was in. Man. All right. Yeah. 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 And so I started doing that and going and kind of breaking those things apart. I love you. Say that to yourself. I love you. What do you hear? What's the first thing that comes up? Well, you don't deserve love because you're too fat. Wait a minute. Am I? What? Where's that from? Like, and I started to examine the thoughts that came up. Um, who, how dare you have the audacity yeah. to say you love yourself? How narcissistic. And I actually went through this phase where I just kept doing it. And I was like, I'm just going to push through this. And eventually I, something's going to give. And I went through a week where I was so happy because I was like, oh, I found this thing. I found this person. It was me this whole time. Like, because I wouldn't talk the way I used to talk to myself. I wouldn't talk to my spouse that way. And I wouldn't even talk to my dog that way. The horrible shit that I was saying to myself. Give me some greatest hits. With the, <laughs> I things. mean, every, every I, you can't parallel park for shit. Um, you're, obviously, I'm too fat. I'm always too fat. Uh, that wrinkle on your forehead, you need to get Botox. It's not, it's not cute. Your teeth are definitely not white enough. You better succeed. Otherwise, if you don't, you, you're going to be a loser. No one's going to love you. You'll never get, you'll never amount to anything. You'll be forgotten. Blah, blah, blah. Um, I never thought I was stupid. I knew that I was smarter than my mother. So that really helped me out. (laughs) Plus I read a lot of philosophy books to make me feel superior to other people. That's a. I have a question for you. Since you seem like you know, why why is the ego so negatively bent? Like, what's why does it hunt for bad stuff all the time? Like, why are we programmed negatively? I think it's trying to make sense. I think that's why it's always saying you're better than or you're worse than. Is it's trying to come up with a result? But life is not black and white like the ego wants it to be. Mm. So the 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 ego is not subtle. I think. Mm. So it it it's always looking for some type of finality so mm-hmm. that it that we can rest and go here's the answer now I know the truth now I can move on to something else right that's why I think it goes back to self love cuz when I'm in a place of self love it doesn't matter what other people think of me isn't that amazing and i yeah, and I just started praying to every morning and meditating and being like, just God, same thing what you're doing. Take this stuff from me. Take this. Help me see clearly on this and that. And it really helps align you with yourself and with the sense that you're not the end of it. Like, it can't end in my puny little dumb brain. If you can connect with 
something, someone meaningful. That's really the game. For me, the work trumps the, uh, the anxiety, the depression, the, the, the nightmare that is the trap of my ego thoughts mm -hmm. about the judgment about who I am. I can't do that. I can't bear that anymore. That's why I started going to see Shrink Man. I'm like, why am I riddled? Why? why? My mother, <laughs> my mother was in the hospital. She, quote, had a stroke. Uh, and I went to, this is years ago, and I went to visit her. I'm like, I'm a, to the doctor. I'm like, oh, did she have a stroke? No, she had a panic attack and uh, lamps are us and we had to send the ambulance for her. Um, and I, that, that's the last time I saw my mother in, in that hospital. And I get calls from social workers every now and then that your mother's not taking her medicine. I'm like, well, fucking not mm -hmm. my problem. Like, <laughs> Good go. for you. Well, because I know she's cared for financially, so I don't feel bad. Yeah. And she sends me cryptic emails or, no, I'm sorry, she stopped using emails or the telephone because they're listening. Um, so oh, man, she's really deep. descended. Yeah. Um, she used to send me letters to the clubs I was working, which was kind of a neat, a nice surprise, like cryptic things about listening to messages and blah, blah, blah. Oh my God. But, uh, yeah. This... But the point is, is like, I, again, I can focus on that sadness and that shit. And and you know oh. that she would drag you down with her if you tried to quote unquote fix her yeah. or give her what she needed because, Oh, God. And that's the thing about people with borderline personality that I feel so much for is their ability to trust is because they were probably yes. abandoned so severely Ooh. is it's the thing that stands between you and having meaning and purpose in your yeah. life. Because if you can't get vulnerable in trust, you can't make that human connection. Yeah. And that's why I'm always on my soapbox about support groups mm. finding people that are appropriate that you can bond with some people can get it through therapy or close friends but for a lot of people they don't have people in their lives that can talk that you know language of the of the heart where you can get real and you mm -hmm. can let all of your or at least some of your shame and your secrets and and that stuff yeah because that's the alienating part of this is that what what you and I went through, it's so extreme to a lot of people. And like my husband, uh, he has such a great family and he didn't experience the same things I did. And so I don't feel as though we speak the same exact language. Whereas you here, I'm like, oh yeah, you get that because you've had a similar thing going and it helps. I, I should probably reach out to more people that have had it. I just don't, I don't know. I'm so, I'm still kind of, it's still raw. It's still it's still processing. It's I'm still. That's why I think I came here to get it out. And like, all right, man. And all the therapy you're doing is definitely moving, moving yeah, you forward. I just, I just find support groups turbo, turbo charge. Ooh, I like the it. experience. It just uh, it exponentiates. How's that for another Ooh. nice word? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I I need both. They both give me uh, things different, yeah. different things. Oh, I wanted to say about my mom too, and I. I started to have empathy for people with this thing, with BPD. Um, she had a horrific childhood, just just to go on record, like, mother dies, her mother dies of breast cancer when my mother is 12 years old. Her own father gives her up for adoption, because <laughs> oh. he's an alcoholic and can't care for her. She's adopted by some relative, the husband's abusive, I'm pretty sure she was sexually molested, my mother, and abused. And then she marries my dad and they leave this their country and then she's abandoned again in her mind by my father because of a divorce. So like, I, I get it. Like, I just want that to be clear too. Like, I get that, like Louise Hayes says, we're all victims of victims. And like, my mother could not give me what she didn't have. And I totally get that. And I get, I mean, it's hard for me to see it from her person. It's so fucking hard for me to go like, yeah, I feel, you know, I hope people out there at BPD or, cause I just, I, I, I can't, I'm not there yet. I'm not. And it's not your burden to carry. Yeah. It's you have your own burden to, to carry and you can have empathy for somebody without carrying their pain. Yeah. Those, though you don't have to save them. You know, you're, you're not a bad person for not going to quote unquote save somebody because you oh, can't it's not gonna happen you can't well if i respond to the letters if i respond to the wacky doodle 
it's a cycle of now okay so here's what's going to happen mom i'm going to show up and now i'm going to repent for what she didn't come to my wedding that's the last time I, she didn't come to my wedding because i got married when she was going through a divorce and how dare i get married when she's suffering oh so yeah God. so she didn't come to my wedding and like which is a blessing because God forbid she would have oh, fucking turned it into about scene. her. Yeah. Oh my God. My mother in law and her. Okay. How did you not make me the wedding band? <laughs> Why am I not singing? Exactly. Oh my God. Uh, yeah. God damn it. Yeah. What a nightmare. That so uh, I think the last, from your past, the last thing we were talking about was when you uh, went to college, you had. Yeah panic attacks or no not severe. panic attack oh, well as a okay. child too i had yeah. them yeah as a child i had a severe phobia of vomiting as a kid because i was uh my mother when i would vomit would overreact to it i think is what happened and so i she was very boundary stepping with my body too right like that's another part of it is that they're enmeshed in your body i'm an it's extension almost like of it's, her yes yeah oh my god like i got my period for the first time and she was like she goes i told her i go mom i got a period let me see let you see let you see what bitch like by that time i was like you're not gonna see not like fuck you it was just uh, my body was her body yeah and so to control the vomiting for me or to have that food phobia i think i didn't have an eating disorder but like it was almost there it was right on the cusp of it you know i get a lot of um female listeners and survey takers who had that same experience with their moms where like mm. they wanted to inspect their vaginas to yes. make everything was okay to make them see their you know I would look at your periods and let me see how your bosoms are <laughs> yeah. developing oh yeah yeah that's, all of that so embarrassing that that en enmeshment thing yeah, yeah that uh, in my book that's that's covert sexual abuse it may not have been sure it's sexual to them but it's it affects oh our our sexuality. Say no more. It's, it makes intimacy difficult. Have you struggled with physical intimacy? Yeah, I mean, my mother, my mother being or, or emotional intimacy. Yeah, yeah, all one. of the above. A, B, C, D, all yeah. the yeah. Uh, my mother was so being a good European in their minds. You know, both my parents were like walk around naked for many years. Like we were naked, fine. But uh, mom felt the need to teach me about sex very early, like nine years old. It's the sex books. It's the Oh, here's the oral sex creams I use with my boyfriends. Here's Playgirl magazine. And I'm like, why are you telling me this? Here's my here's my douche bag that I keep. And like the old school douche bag with the big red bulb. Like Lenny Bruce, I think's mother, he describes her having the same one. Like, Jesus, do I need to see everything that goes into your vagina? So I was so grossed out by that and I had so much guilt around sexuality until I got married and then that really like every time I had boyfriends and I was I had a great I my first boyfriend was awesome the boy I lost my virginity to why we dated for a year before and he was like this still kind uh person I didn't I was lucky in that I my dad loved me so I had good relationships with dudes that wasn't the problem guilt was the problem that's awesome but then I got married and the guilt subsided catholic oh it's subsided it subsided once i, I see. got married you, you became comfortable with your with sex and sexuality your body. and i didn't oh i wasn't over sex the way some girls go i was angry i was a punker i was violent i was you know taking baseball bats to mailboxes i was rage i wasn't whoring that probably helped <laughs> you the the, the hitting the mailboxes oh, fantastic yeah i love violence and, and yeah. give me some snapshots of the violence <laughs> hey. well okay yeah me and my friend jenny like we would egg egg cars in the neighborhood the or best. break windows Fuck. and that was bad i mean looking back i was a real asshole i would hate for someone to do that to my stuff yeah. but I egging was it. okay in my book breaking oh, so windows would it was a, a little a little yeah. over my line but well, egg in a car i love the adrenaline rush yeah. of running you know, if they would, if their brakes would screech, that was like a sh <laughs> shot of cocaine. Oh, it I used was... to throw cans of food onto the freeway and then hear the crash. Oh my god! And I'd be like, oh my god! Like I was a psycho. That's bad. That's I feel bad about that. Yeah. One. God damn it! Yeah, oh no, I'm all fucking guilty. Um. Anyway, we hit we uh <laughs> when there when there wasn't snow, uh. So you you know. When winter was over and you couldn't snowball cars, somebody came up with the idea one time, well, let's throw mud balls at them. Oh, and so we were no. throwing mud balls at cars, and this car passed by us, and I saw that the window was rolled down. Oof. And 
we didn't hear anything hit, but its oh. brakes screeched, which I think meant that we had hit them. <laughs> And this car started chasing us, and we were in downtown Homewood, and my friend and I, we all split, because we were, this guy was pissed, and he was big, and it started chasing us, and we ran down this alley, and I remember we opened the door to try to go into this place, and there was a bunch of people, like, dancing, it was like a disco (laughs) lesson. And and we're like, oh, oh, we can't go in there. And so we hid behind the, the door. We opened the door and we hid behind it. And our legs were showing, you know, underneath oh, the door. Fuck. And the car, we the car came down the alley, just slowly cruising for us. I don't think I've ever been as scared as I was. And I heard the little kid saying, kill him, daddy. Oh. Kill him. And it didn't see us, and it passed by. And I, I, we never, th- we never threw mud balls again after that. But that high, it's the best. We were high for hours after that. It was talking about it. Yeah, I was shaking. It was, it was am- amazing. See, I like that, and I was a punker too, and I love that aggression. That punk rock, punk rock was the best thing that ever happened to me. And then we go to shows out in Hollywood, and I was. I would go into a mosh pit for like five oh, seconds. Colliding I, with people is the best. Oh, it's so great. I really have. And I think because I didn't want to identify feminine, so I identify masculine. My father was the sane one. So I always t- I always took the boys. I did what the boys were doing. I was more of a tomboy, and I liked that. Mm-hmm. Hey, I want to ask you something, though. So when your mom sexualizes you, and you're essentially like your mom's boyfriend in a weird way, like, did you assume the role of like that... Did she have a boyfriend or a husband? She had a, a, you know, my dad, but he was so emotionally checked out and I <laughs> knew didn't like her. I knew was annoyed by her. He was just annoyed by being alive. You know, he functioned, he wrote checks, he provided for us, but it, it was, he was in his own world at the end of oh. the couch. And she would complain to me. I mean, as early as seven years old about how she wanted to leave him. Oh, and, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. The, I heard the whole, all that shit. So I'd have to hear these tirades and she would cry and I'd have to go <laughs> rescue and comfort yep, her. Yep. So, um, You're parenting the parent for sure. Yeah, absolutely. It was, I was the circuit spouse, which I'm told is super, super common when one, when somebody is going to make up for that lack of attention. So she chose you. She chose me. And how many brothers and sisters? I had one brother and a cousin who was raised with us. And she and my brother didn't get along. So um, I was the, you know, I was I was it. I I always felt like I was the last her last hope for for happiness. It was it was upon me to make her laugh, to cheer her up when she was sad, to listen to her diatribes because nobody else would would listen to her and. In many ways, it it kind of boosted my ego because I felt like, oh, I'm a good person. I'm an adult. But you don't realize that you're robbing yourself of your childhood. It's like the the child that gets into an inappropriate relationship with, um, you know, somebody in their 20s. That child Mm. is flattered. It's a high to them. And they don't realize at the time what is being done to them. So predatory. I know I had girls at the school I went to, 13-year-olds, 14-year-olds dating, 21-year-olds. And you're like, that's you can't not tell them. cool, man. You can't tell them. It's so predatory. That's so crazy, dude. And they think it's a compliment, but they don't realize they're an object to that person. Absolutely. It's disgusting. Yeah. It's yeah. really uncool. So do you have, um, and I imagine by the time you're an adult and you're, you know, marriage comes around was the idea because i know for me the idea of being a mother was very exhausting for me it was like i can't i can't no. touch that role because i i've got a bad one and how will i be a good mom like did you were you exhausted by your wife or the I, idea it, just, it 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 never well my wife has never wanted to have kids so we were on that that same page and my i, I didn't objectify my wife the way i did um other women in my life you know I became a womanizer um and, you know in college I was finally getting laid and it was <laughs> it was just so easy for women to be objects to me and that doesn't mean that I you know I didn't l- listen to them and uh, have nice conversations with them but it was like okay almost like things I would throw away after mm-hmm. I, I've seen it, it, to me it was all about I want to know what your body looks like right. feels like smells like and it, once I had done that, it was like, I don't have any more need for you because I think there was something terrifying about a woman, a woman wanting 
intimacy from me. Of course, because it's all consuming. It would all it consuming. Would, it I would felt like ruin yes, you. Exactly. Like your mother. I'm going to be yeah. overwhelmed. That's and how I worry with pe- with women too. I have I have mom, I have woman issues. Do you have difficulty making female friends? I did for a while. I only and today the my closest female. I do have female friends that I've had for years, but they're more alphas. Mm-hmm. I I have an easier time with those. Yeah, I found myself hating women. I go, why do I, wait, wait a minute, who do I hate here? I had never realized how much rage I had at women because the, I think the sexual attraction made me think, oh no, I love right. women. And it wasn't probably until about three or four years ago um, that I, I had a couple of female friends that the, the, that I felt that way about, but it wasn't until a couple of years ago and doing the podcast that I really started to connect with women and feel that that motherly vibe that 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 softness that really you can only get from from a a woman and it. I was like, where's this been my whole life? Mm. Oh, I've been, it's always been there. Mm-hmm. It just, I never realized it was, it was there. And it came from support groups, from being loved unconditionally mm. in support groups. And once I let that love in, it it felt so comforting to me. It mm-hmm. was like the warmest, warmest blanket. And so I have some some great female friends. And my relationship with my wife has evolved to now where I I'm able to be a little more vulnerable around her. And That's to, huge. Yeah, it is. And to talk about my fears and not worry about being judged because she's not my mom. Right, right, right. She wears right. a mask of my mom when we fuck because otherwise I can't come. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Oh, yeah. So. Um, cray, cray, man. So you're able now to. to have intimacy and have some female yes, friends. Yes, and, and also, like, this is it's so corny, but adopting Theo, my dog, a year ago, uh, really brought out the feminine side to me because, like, being a stand-up comic, I, uh, I've i been a comic now for just 11 years, and, and it's such a masculine role to assume it is. when you're telling jokes, you must dominate. You are the alpha. And that's, I think, why a lot of people hate female comics. There's a shift in the power dynamic of what a woman's supposed to be in society. We're still a sexist culture. So <laughs> um, uh, so I, I found myself like, why am I so hard, hard, emotionally hard? It doesn't feel like it resonates with who I am. I'm a woman. And, you know, mothering this dog, as corny as that sounds like, really brought that out of me. And I'm like, oh, I, I like caring for stuff. I... I love cooking for my husband. I love nurturing my dog and my husband. I, 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 that role to me is, it's so right. And why shouldn't I want to care for these people and this dog? <laughs> so, There's yeah. nothing like talking to your dog like it's a baby. He's a boo-boo. He's, a <laughs> He's the best. The old Huxtable is my boo-boo. Here he is. He's hanging out. Yeah, you know. So I accepted that I'm a girl, essentially. I was so ashamed of being a a girl or girly my whole Mm -hmm. life. And now I'm like, well, it's so wrong with that. Is that necessarily just because society doesn't privilege a lot of things? Society doesn't privilege uh, motherhood or because it's not paid work, right? To stay home and raise your kids, you're you're considered less than a man who brings home a paycheck. Still, I believe. I don't think it's. And yet there's nothing more important to the future of the world than good moms <laughs> good, good moms good dads but you know nurturing yes and good dads too yeah. and i should say for the record that men have really facilitated a lot of the women's movement changes too like men have come around a lot obviously too so i don't hate dudes it, it, it had anything. guys had to get on board for it to move any further <laughs> forward you know what yeah, i mean yeah yeah it's like the civil rights movement would have never got anywhere if black people were the only ones behind it that's true yeah that's so true and yeah. I think we're in in the middle of that with the with the gay rights movement oh, yeah, or for the sure. LGBT. That's the next, yeah. Um, and yeah, it's it's the dark ages of uh, acceptance for people uh, outside, you know, the he- <gasps> the hetero world. You know, it's so funny. My mother hates gay people too so much. Like I remember. Uh, oh, this is my favorite. When I was a little girl, I was like, "Mom, what's a dyke?" Because I had seen that movie, Reform School Girls. Because my she took my mother and her boyfriend at the time took me to see that when I was a child. It's an R-rated movie, just so you know. <laughs> and there's girls making. It's like a cheesy movie. And I'm like, "What's a dyke?" 
And she goes, oh, a dyke? Ugh, disgusting lesbians. I don't know what women doing to each other, licking each other all day long. <laughs> <laughs> all day long. Oh. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, surely it can't be that. What? Is that all? Uh, and her, her loathing of gay people. I'm like, oh my gosh, she just hates everybody. Even 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 lesbians. Who hates lesbians? They're fantastic. Yeah. <sighs> wow. Well, whatever. Maybe she's gay secretly. Who knows? Do you have any any other? Yeah, uh, I just things wanted to wanted look to just to make sure I'm not forgetting because I uh, I hate my mom. We covered that. I don't feel bad about that. <laughs> oh, do you ever? You have your doggies. Mm-hmm. Do you have an irrational fear that when you're holding your dog, you'll just drop him for no reason and kill him? Sometimes. When I bring the water <laughs> bottles in from the porch, you know, we have the five-gallon uh, water water bottles. Like the sparklets yeah. things? Yeah. And whenever I carry them in, you know, whenever you come in from the outside, they're they're near you and they're all excited. And I'm always afraid I'm going to drop that big one on, <laughs> on Herbert because that, that would kill him. He only weighs like 13 pounds. Oh, do you have an irrational fear... Of like you're in a meeting, like a formal setting, and screaming an inappropriate word, like just n bomb, like dropping for no reason. Uh, not not so much, but it, it has crossed my mind before. But that's not <laughs> that's not a big one uh, with me. <laughs> that one's mine for some reason. That I'm always going to say the absolute wrong thing. Uh, it pops into my head all the time. What would be the worst thing I could do yeah. right here? Oh, I you do know? that too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What, <laughs> and just horrible, mean shit that I would say that would be like scientifically the most hurtful thing I could say to somebody. <laughs> I will I will think that. Um. No, I think that's all I had. I, thanks for having me. And I, I, I think this is the beginning of like me turning a corner on, on, on this because I'm not able to really make fun of her yet. And I, I would love to make fun of her. Um, I'm almost there. So maybe if I talk about her more, yeah. I'll get to make fun of her. So. It, it, it sounds like you're really moving forward with the, with a lot of this stuff. I'm trying, stuff. dude. And um, you're just a, a, a just a fun person to, to oh, talk thanks, to. Oh, Paul. Yeah, I'm really, I really like glad. I like you too. Let's hang out. Let's have yeah. our support group. Let's let's do that. <laughs> let's, let's start our coffee support group. Will you come on your mom's I- house one day? Oh, I'd love to. Okay. Yeah. We don't we don't talk about this. We talk about pooping and stuff. Do you talk about poops? Oh, I got some great poop stories. <laughs> Please come over to yeah. come to, to ours. The, the listeners have heard all of them. They're probably tired of them, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Well, our listeners, it's new to us. So. Yeah. Yeah, I'd love to. So let's yeah. uh, we'll we'll set something off. For sure. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Christina. Yeah. <laughs>